be up and running? I believe so. Okay. And Executive Director Pratt, are you ready? I'm ready. Let's get started. Okay. All right. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Environmental Quality Board meeting. Today is the 19th of January. It is approximately one uh, four p.m. I'm calling the meeting to order. My name is Margaret Anderson Kelleher. I serve as the chair of the EQB, and uh, I will share a little bit about how our meeting is organized today, which is different than how it normally uh, runs. So we'll have a few notes on that. But I do want to say that since our last meeting, um, some of you may be aware that uh, I have given uh, notice to the governor that I will be leaving MnDOT in around the beginning of March to go to the city of Minneapolis to lead their Department of Public Works pending uh, city council approval. Uh, the mayor has nominated me for that position. And so I wanna share that with you. We are executive director Pratt and I are working with the governor's office on what comes next uh, and who might come next for the EQB chair. And we're gonna work through those issues. But I just wanna assure you that I will be with you for this meeting and the next meeting and really appreciate uh, everyone's uh, kind notes uh, and words of wisdom as I am moving uh, into a new chapter. As I keep saying, all good things come to an end and then they begin again in a new way. So, all right, uh, today's meeting, we are going to be in our full board meeting for about an hour and Executive Director Pratt is going to take us through some uh, further detail on as we make that transition. But at about an hour, we will transition. I will actually adjourn the EQB board meeting and we will move into the ARIS subcommittee meeting. And then chair of the ARIS subcommittee, Commissioner Stroman will take over the meeting. I will remain with you, uh, but that is, we've decided that for the sake of what is on the agenda, that is probably the best way to do these two meetings this month. And I also wanna acknowledge that we do have a new board member with us. And so I'm gonna ask, uh, our new public board member from the 6th Congressional District, uh, Mr. Paul Nelson, to come on to camera and before we even move to roll call and maybe he would like to say a few words uh, to all of you before we start the official roll call. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I appreciate the appointment and some of you I already know from before I retired. Now that I'm retired, I look forward to working with you again. Thanks. Great. Well, glad to have you. Thank you so much. Um, appreciate your willingness to serve and continue public service in a new way in retirement. So thank you so much and, and really appreciate your, your technical background that you and perspective you bring to this. So. All right, um, I'm gonna have Faith uh, call the roll officially. And so you can respond with yes or present uh, when she calls your name or if you're the proxy. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'll start with Commissioner Grace Arnold, who I believe is not going to be here today. That's correct, Faith, but this is Louise Miltich, and I am standing in as a proxy for Grace. Great, thank you. Thank you. Public member Kristen I.D. Tollefson. She reached out a moment ago to say that her audio may not be working, but we will work on that. I know she's here. Public member Alan Forsberg. Present. Public member Julie Gehring. Present. Commissioner Steve Grove. I believe he has a proxy coming, but maybe um, not here yet. Deputy Commissioner Kevin McKinnon. Commissioner Katrina Kessler. 
President, Public Member Mehmet Konar Steenberg. Yes, I'm here. Public Member Paul Nelson. Present. Commissioner Jan Malcolm. And I believe she is not able to be here. Public Member Nick Martin. Yes, I'm here. Public Member Brian Murdoch. He may be joining by phone. Commissioner Tom Peterson. Is excused today. Is excused, yep, and no proxy. Commissioner Alice Roberts Davis. Good afternoon, I'm here. Commissioner Sarah Stroman. Present, good afternoon. EQB Vice Chair and Bowser Chair Gerald Van Amberg. Here, good afternoon. Public Member uh, Benjamin Yawaki. Present. And Met Council Chair, oh, excuse me, Member Sue Bento. Here. Thank you, that's all the members. Okay, well, thank you so much, Faith. I really appreciate that, uh, you being willing to call the roll. And I think we will keep our eyes open for Dan Huff from the Department of Health. He might be stepping in for Commissioner Malcolm. The next item on our agenda is the approval of the consent agenda. And the consent agenda has both the minutes from the November 17th EQB meeting. You'll find that on packet page seven and then the proposed agenda for today's board meeting. And so I'm looking for someone to move the consent agenda. Any board member? Um, I will do that, Al Forsberg. Okay, uh, board member Forsberg moves the consent agenda. A second. Is second, very even Amberg. Oh, thank you. And any discussion on the consent agenda? Hearing none, I'm going to have you all unmute now, and we're going to do this as a voice vote. All those in favor of the consent agenda, the November 17th minutes and today's January 19th agenda, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Nay. The motion prevails and the agenda and the minutes, the minutes are adopted and the consent agenda is adopted. Next, I'm going to turn this over to our executive director, Katie Pratt for her executive director report. Thank you, madam chair. Good afternoon, everyone. Just 1 quick announcement today, which is to give folks an update on the. The transition around our board member appointments and just letting you know, uh, as a reminder, we have 4 open seats currently um, from congressional districts 1, 2, 7 and 8 and the appointments process is still underway. We're expecting appointments to to happen closer to the end of March at this stage. So 2 things about that 1, it's not too late to put in an application if there's. There's uh, folks out there who are interested in serving on the EQB. You can still get an application in. And then the, the other thing is that our current seated members are able to continue serving in their role until appointments are made. And they've graciously agreed to, to sit in, in their role and help us with the transition. So we thank our, our current and outgoing members as well. And feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions about our public member appointments. Um, next, I just want to talk you through the logistics today. As the chair mentioned, we have kind of a two part meeting. So the first approximately hour to about two o'clock is, um, is a full board meeting and we'll be discussing a draft legislative report on federal clean water act section 404 assumption. Now that report is available on our website and I'll have 1 of my staff members put a link in the chat to that report. If you want to follow along with the discussion. Um, so, uh, again, that'll be approximately till 2 o'clock, then we'll adjourn the full board meeting, but we'll stay right here in the same WebEx. So members of the public and board members, you don't have to go to any different meeting. You could just stay right here in this WebEx. And then we'll start an ARIS meeting um, at that point and, and from about 2 to 4 will be our ARIS portion of the agenda. Board members, if you don't formally sit on the ARIS 
subcommittee, you're welcome to stay for that portion of the meeting as well. And of course, both both sections are open to the public. Um, one uh, just correction to make on our agenda for the ARIS portion of the meeting. We listed on our agenda the members of the subcommittee for pilot program implementation. And we in error listed Commissioner Steve Grove as a member of that subcommittee. As much as we would like to sign um, Commissioner Grove up for more work, he doesn't actually set, serve on that subcommittee. So just note that, note that correction. Um, a couple other logistics as we make our way through the agenda. So first of all, board members, just as a reminder, when we do, you'll have time for discussion after each of the agenda items today. When we do have discussion, please remember to turn your cameras on if you have that available. Please introduce yourselves when you give a comment. It helps people follow along with the meeting um, and, and you know, try to make this as discussion-like as possible. And then members of the public, there will again be time for public comment uh, for each of the, the sections of the meeting today after the 404 discussion and then during the ARIS meeting as well. If you're interested in making public comment, we'll be using the raise hand feature in WebEx and, and Eric, if you could just advance the slide so I can show that, that raise hand feature. Um, excellent. So there you'll see if you if you go um, navigate down to the participants button on the lower right of your screen and you open that up and then you scroll to your name um, next to your name is a little is a little hand that you can raise up indicating that you would like to make public comment um, if you're joining us via a, a phone you'll have to navigate to there's kind of three dots on the bottom of your screen and if you click on those you should see a raised hand feature if for some reason that's not working for you, you can send us a chat um, and we'll be, we'll be monitoring that and make sure that you get a chance to, to make public comment. Um, and you can, we have in our packet, we have as well as phone number for tech support if you need that during the meeting. So those are the logistics to, for today and I will turn it back to, um, to Chair Anderson Kelleher. Well, thank you, Executive Director Pratt. I, um, want to thank you and your staff for all the excellent preparation for this meeting today and uh, for all the meetings. So thank you. Next, um, we're going to move to our item uh, number four on the agenda, the, four, the 404 assumption study. To introduce this topic, I'm going to call on the executive director of Bowser, the Board of Water and Soil Resources, John Jasky, to introduce the topic and our presenters today. John? Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair, and, and congratulations on your on your new position. Uh, success seems to follow you around, so I'm sure that will continue. Thank you. That was kind of you. Yeah. All true, but uh, you know the, the this uh, topic that you're going to hear about in this report, and I want to acknowledge the the work that went into this from the well, several staff at the DNR and the NPCA and Bowser that put this together. We'll have a short presentation that will be a little more uh, detailed. You know, I, I thought I'd just give a little bit of a high level kind of what this is and, and what's the point of it in the first place uh, overview and then turn it over to Les Lynn to go through the, those more specific details that are a summary of the report, which of course I'm sure you already have heard from your executive director, Katie Pratt, that this was something that the legislature commissioned uh, EQB and then, of course, the agencies that are responsible for well and protection and sort of the three I just named were the ones that were tasked with putting this report together. And so that's what you're getting from us. And before I have less go through that, I thought I'd just take, a, take us back about 45 years. Um, to the late 1970s when uh, you know the Clean Water Act was was passed and then there were some uh, subsequent amendments to it and very few since then, maybe none, many court cases and other such things that have interpreted that law over the years. But one of the fundamental parts of it was that this federal law would be implemented, you know, via state mechanisms. And of course in Minnesota that's obviously true and, and you know MPCA has been largely the uh, the pathway for that to be accomplished in Minnesota, which you know, gives them the authority through these federal delegations and, of course, uh, you know, state statutes and rules that also are important to carry out the, in the federal clean water uh, uh, duties. One of those uh, back in the late 70s was this idea that we would protect wetlands and waters um, from discharges. It was 
you know, I, the idea was that there would be, uh, you know, fill as one form of discharge and of course others. And, uh, you know, at the time the EPA had this responsibility, but they didn't have a way to, to carry it out. It was important to, to do this immediately because some of the other requirements could take their time and get built with, you know, water quality standards and so forth being built based on science and what have you. But this is a case where if we didn't have a mechanism to implement this national law, uh, you know, there would be losses of wetlands in particular because there wouldn't be a way to have a Thank you, Director Gatsky. Yes. This is Katie. I'm just going to break in for a minute. We're, we're all having a little bit of a hard time hearing you. So perhaps if you could just maybe speak up or get your microphone a little bit closer, that would be, uh, that would be helpful. I would just try and talk louder because I have one microphone that seems to work well, except maybe on WebEx, but we'll, I'll keep going. I'll talk louder. Doesn't mean I'm talking with any more emphasis, just louder to get through the volume challenge. Um, so the EPA had this predicament where we didn't have states ready to do this work. They couldn't do the work. And so the federal government turned to the Army Corps of Engineers who had a presence in every state because they were managing, you know, rivers and harbors and all of the commercial waterways of the country, right? So they said, hey, how about if you, since you're already requiring permission and permits for, for those waters, why don't you just take on this thing too? And, and so that's what happened because they had to have an immediate solution. And so the idea always had been that states would take on this responsibility over time and as they have in other areas and carry this out. Well, the states first had to create a statutory program within their state to be able to be the basis for this. And that didn't happen immediately and it didn't happen very often. And continuing to this day, uh, there are only three states that have done this. Um, Michigan, New Jersey, and Florida in that order. Florida most recently, just in the last couple of years. And so that's been a helpful template for determining what it will take to do this, if it makes sense to do this in Minnesota. Um, you know, the, the why you would do this, it comes right down to the simple as it provides a more straightforward local presence for the permissions and permitting that would be needed to do this work, right? That's the, the general benefit from it because the standard is you have to have an equal or greater level of protection for the state to be given this responsibility. And so this report, you know, outlines some of that. It also uh, just as importantly outlines what it would take to make that possible. And I'll let Les go into those details, but, you know, the, the key thing is that, you know, there's no decision about whether to do this. This analysis is simply uh, saying what it would take in terms of dollars and policy adjustments to do that. Uh, if this is going to continue, of course, that will take a, an action or a directive from the legislature and or the governor to do that, including, as Les we might point out, the attorney general has to sign off on an application if it, in fact, were to be forthcoming. So, uh, you know, this is like a job application. I tell, I tell my staff, I said, it's, you know, you first have to know what the job is. You have to understand what you would be able to do or have to do in order to be successful at that job. And then, of course, you have to make an application interview and then, you know, have someone want to hire you to do this. In this case, EPA is kind of like the employer and the state's like the applicant. And then if this job is, is going well, then, then you pretty much do your job you know, without a lot of oversight. Obviously the EPA does provide that and is required to, and we have reporting requirements to them to make sure we were meeting their standards. But these are all things down the road, obviously. And this report is simply about what it would take to do it in Minnesota from a logistics perspective. And so, it over to Les to walk through this PowerPoint that I think will give you a few more details. Thank you, Madam Chair, uh, for the opportunity to provide this overview. Um, thanks, John. So uh, this, I'm Les Lem, the Wetlands Section Manager for Bowser. Um, I'll, as John mentioned, I'll be uh, kind of going through a little presentation here with you. I think what I will do is, uh, turn my video off while we're going through the presentation just to ensure that we have a, a good enough connection that hopefully you can you can hear me well through the whole thing here um we can uh um, move on to the uh, next slide eric so we could spend hours or days discussing all the details of this topic but for the purpose of today's meeting we'll do our best to provide a brief summary of, uh, you know, 404 assumption and the work that we've done to develop this report. Um, so we'll be going through some, a few slides here that'll just pro provide some context to what is uh, a fairly complicated topic. 
summarize the conclusions of the report in, in terms of the cost estimates that we developed and just uh, briefly uh, look at uh, what's, what's next. Next slide. So just to start a little bit of context and this, this right here is, as well as additional information and more information on a few of the, the next slides here, they're all, um, they're all uh, discussed in a little bit more detail in chapter two of the report. But just some basic uh, background here, you know, these are the state agencies and programs that would be involved in implementing an assumed program. So John mentioned, you know, the US Army Corps of Engineers and how that, um, um, kind of evolved or happened to where the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers is implementing Section 404 of the Federal Clean Water Act. But on the state side, we also have the State Well and Conservation Act implemented by local governments um, with oversight with, by the Board of Water and Soil Resources. We've got the Public Waters Work Permit Program and the Permit to Mine Programs um, with DNR and uh, state water quality standards that are implemented by the Pollution Control Agency. Next slide. So just in a nutshell, um, what 404 assumption is. So the Federal Clean Water Act not only provides protections for the nation's waters, but it allows for state implementation of an equivalent program, um, eliminating separate federal permits in most waters. So um, basically you're looking at the, the state programs, what are the gaps in the state programs compared to what the federal regulations require um, and then address those gaps to develop a comprehensive state program. So I think it's important to note that the state doesn't implement the federal program, but rather EPA determines that the state's program is at least as protective as the federal regulations. So in order to do that, we have to demonstrate we have adequate jurisdiction, that our regulations are at least as protective. We have the legal authority, staff and capacity, enforcement authority, and compliance with certain other standards and some procedural requirements. And if the state can show those things, then um, EPA can deem it essentially as, as at least an equivalent program for purposes of 404 assumption. Next slide. So uh, just a little more context that this is not a new endeavor. We've done a lot of background work on this issue in the past. Um, the most comprehensive is the 2017 feasibility study. Um, that was followed up by some additional work by the state, as well as some uh, related work by the federal agencies, the EPA and the Department of the Army, um, primarily related to assumable waters, which waters the state can basically assume authority over if they were to assume the program. Uh, so that, that information is all relevant and kind of led us to where we're at today. And it's all, this and more is all available on the, on the Bowser website if, if uh, you'd like to go and look at any of this in more detail. Next slide. So this is uh, some information that's contained in the 2017 report as well, but just provide some context. Why are people interested in assumption? Well, those that are interested in assumption have cited several things, but you know some of them are improved permitting timelines, faster processing, reduced regulatory duplication and redundancy. So they're you know they're dealing with one agency instead of two or three. Um, more responsive regulatory authorities dealing with state or state and local versus a federal agency. Um, all of those things combine to result in reduced costs for permit applicants. And also on the environmental side, um, more effective resource management, drawing on localized expertise and better incorporation of watershed planning. And there's a lot of watershed planning happening in the state of Minnesota. So um, that also leads to a little bit more interest um, in this topic. And finally, it, it's congressional policy that the states implement this program. John touched on this earlier that, you know, it was the idea that this would transition to the states. And that is right in, in federal statute that it's the policy of Congress that the states implement this program. Next slide. So that leads us to where we are now. Um, so you, Kind of have an idea of some of the work that was done in the past in, in the past and then there this legislation here was actually originally passed in 2019 and it was amended in 2021 to extend the report deadline there's two main directives in the legislation um, it was directed to eqb to one begin to develop and assemble the material to assume 404 
Um, so notice the word begin. I think this, it recognizes that this is a pretty significant undertaking and that obviously this is not sufficient funding to do the, or time to do the entire process, but to begin to develop that material and then also to provide this report to the legislature on the funding needed to secure 404 assumption. So in other words, how much additional funding would we need to finish developing and assembling the material? And then number two is how much would it cost, um, at least to, to, based on the information we have at this point, how much would it cost to implement the fully assumed program? So the, the legislation also specifically says that um, EQB can execute contracts or interagency agreements to facilitate the work. So um, EQB then subsequently developed an agreement with Bowser um, to kind of coordinate this work and the development of the report and Bowser develops um, agreements with the DNR and the PCA. So you can look the full language of the legislation is included in chapter one of the report if you'd like to see the entire, uh, the entire language. Next slide. So this just gives a little context as to where we are in the process. Um, you know, John meant talked a little bit about this, that you know, this is not the decision to assume. We are over here on the left, we're working on the legislative report on funding estimates. We have, you know, began that work to, to uh, assemble some of those materials. Assembly of the materials essentially at this point means kind of doing some of that program development work to figure out how the how the program would look if the state were to assume. So then after this report is submitted, if there's an additional appropriation of funds to continue that work, we would continue assembling the materials, continue working on, you know, developing the programs, what they would look like under an assumption under under 404 assumption, identifying the specific statute changes, et cetera. Then down the road would come that decision as to whether we would actually um, actually decide, the state would actually decide to apply for assumption or not. At that point, then we would kind of go through the process of, of uh, making the necessary changes and applying to EPA for, uh, for 404 assumption. Next slide. So in order to do this, um, you know, you really have to know what you're going to do in order to know how much it's going to cost. So we looked at the federal requirements for assumption, compared them to the existing state programs and identified the gaps and, um, you know, the things that we would need to change or modify under assumption. Then, you know, we looked at different options for doing that. We identified the changes that would need to be made to the state programs and how many, how much staffing um, it would take to implement those changes and, and other related costs as well. Um, then that's how we could determine, you know, what are the annual costs to do that? You know, and then of course, based on where we're at, what are the additional costs that we would, additional funds we would need to, to also to finish, kind of finish this work that we've started. So those are the two funding estimates that we, uh, we were asked to, uh, to come up with. So. As far as kind of coordination of this work, we, you know, this, as you, as you saw earlier, this um, process or this effort, I guess, if you want to call it, started quite a few years ago. We've con so we continued the process used under the past work, like with the 2017 feasibility study and some of that subsequent work, as far as having a, a stakeholder group where we had a kind of a core group for for meetings and we had a larger stakeholder list to share information with. So we had three meetings with that core group. We had multiple meetings and presentations to just various interest groups. Um, we had a couple tribal meetings. And then of course, a lot of agency coordination with agency staff, both within and amongst the, the state agencies, but uh, a lot of coordination with the uh, EPA. As you can, as you can imagine, is a very necessary part of uh, of the work that we were doing um, to determine you know, what will work and what will EPA accept under assumption. So next slide. So these are the primary program development issues that we had to address in order to develop the cost estimates contained in the report. You know, as I mentioned earlier, we, we, we had to know what we were going to do and how we were going to do it in order to, uh, you know, at least a, um, a pretty good idea, have a pretty good idea of those things in order to come up with the cost estimates. And these are addressed in chapter three of the report. So I won't go, in, go into a lot of detail, but um, just I'll, I'll go through them briefly here. So Bowser 
EPA has indicated and that based on the federal regulations, um, it has to be a state agency that has the permitting authority. Well, for if you're if a state what if a state is going to assume um, 404 program, well Bowser. Uh, technically does not have permitting authority. While we do promulgate the Wetland Conservation Act rules, it's the local governments that actually make decisions on permit applications. So that was something we had to address. We had some original cost estimates in the 2017 report that um, we actually were able to modify significantly because we came up with a different way of addressing it that, that is able to maintain that local government role uh, almost as it is now. Uh, and that we're so by doing that, we were able to reduce those cost estimates significantly. Uh, we also looked at expanding the Wetland Conservation Act regulatory scope to close some gaps in state jurisdiction. There was a, for the most part, the state has greater jurisdictional authority than the federal government does, but there was a couple, uh, you know, a couple instances where that's not the case. Um, there are certain public non public water. Uh, basins that are basically too small to be a lake and, and too uh, deep to be a wetland. There are some headwater stream reaches that are not on the public waters uh, inventory, so they're not regulated under DNR's program. And the Wetland Conservation Act has, has uh, not been implemented um, historically on federal lands, which under assumption we would have to do that. So there was a few issues we had to, a few gaps we had to close there. Um, we had to look at some expanded mitigation standards and options or expanding some mitigation standards and options. Um, the state agencies would need to screen applications for potential impacts to threatened and endangered species and historic properties. Those aren't things that um, we as the state agencies would have to deal with. It, that would be EPA's responsibility under 404 assumption, but we would have um, some need to screen those to be able to forward them to EPA when there is a potential for um, impacts to, to teeny species or historic properties. Next slide. Um, we'd have to implement a process for the MPCA review of Bowser and DNR issued permits to ensure that water quality standards are met. Right now that occurs under something called the 401 certification process. So we just looked at a way to, we looked at a way to, to uh, implement something similar for the review of state permits rather than the way it currently works under the 401 certification process where the PCA reviews federal permits that are currently issued by the, by the Corps of Engineers. Um, there's a few, you know, some additional co coordination requirements for application review and permit issuance. In some instances, there's more coordination with federal agencies. Certain instances, there's more coordination required for tribes or with other states. Um, so those are a few additional uh, things that do not occur under the under the current state programs, um, at least uh, not to the extent that they need to be um, under assumption. There's uh, an annual report required to EPA. Uh, we also looked at developing and or enhancing online permitting systems to help facilitate some of the above tasks and to be able to do them much more efficiently. And of course, associated with all this, there'd be staff training and public outreach that we'd have to do. So next slide. So here's the, the funding estimates that we came up with. Um, this is the additional funding. This is annual funding. So this would be every year, the additional funding needed to implement the state assumed program. So this is um, over and above what the agencies currently receive. And the, this is um, located in table two in chapter four, and there's some more detail provided um, with it at that point. but. Basically, we're looking at uh, about, you know, these are approximate at this point, but about 2.1 million for Bowser, 2.7 million for, for DNR. And if we can, if we can implement uh, the kind of a similar process like we came up with um, for the PCA review of state permits, and we can kind of replicate that system, we think that PCA's costs um, would not go up at all, but you know, that's something that um, would be addressed, I guess, as with all of these. Um, if we continue to move forward, we would refine these estimates because these are based on the, the information that we currently have available. Um, so if we continue working on this and working out some more of those details, we fully expect that these would uh, these estimates would be refined and, and um, finalized, I guess, uh, once we got the, um, all the details figure, fully figured out. So just also note that the Bowser estimate 
includes additional funding for local governments um, because as I mentioned, we did come up with a process that uh, works for EPA that we could um, um, maintain the local government's role in implementing the Wetland Conservation Act, very similar to what it is now. Next slide. So this is table three in the report. Um, and this is the additional funding necessary to secure 404 assumption to use the language that's in the legislation. So in other words, this is one-time funding that we would need to continue this work that we've started, to continue the program development work, um, to, to figure out the details of how the programs would be implemented, assemble the, the draft 404 assumption application materials, um, and, and come up with final, final cost estimates. So, you know, if, if, if approved, you know, they, we, we think this funding would cover at least the next biennium, you know, potentially maybe even three years um, to, to do that work. And that, that again is table three in the report. Next slide. So if, if, if the funds in table three were appropriated, after that work had been completed using those funds that we just discussed in the last slide, then if the state were to decide, yeah, we're gonna make the decision, the legislature, the governor's office, et cetera, would make the decision to move forward with an application for 404 assumption, there'd be some additional one-time costs for program startup. Now, I mentioned the online permitting system work earlier. Um, we'd have to develop a WAC online permitting system, about a million and a half, update DNR's current MPAR system. And then there's some other things that we know there'll be cost for, but it's a little too early to know exactly what those costs would be. Um, amending state statutes and rules <clears throat> that would obviously depend on the specific changes. So some of these changes we could do in statute, some via rule, some via policy, and those all have different costs and timelines associated with them. So we need to figure out those details to know um, a little bit more about what these costs would be, you know, finalizing the agreements with the federal agencies, just kind of going through that formal application process, and of course the training and, outs and outreach. Those costs, if we get to that point, and if a decision is made to apply, you know, then we would um, we would have uh, then these these costs would be incurred then. So we would have a better estimate um, after we've completed some additional work what those costs would actually be. Uh, next slide. So most of this was addressed in that timeline slide that you saw earlier, but the primary takeaway, you know, from this slide here at this point is that there's a series of decisions that would yet have to be made before the state would actually assume. So the first is actually number one, you know, after we submit this legislative report, if the legislature decides, yep, let's continue working on this, let's continue uh, assembling the materials and doing the additional uh, research and program development work that's necessary in order for us to make a, a fully informed decision, then that those funds would be appropriate and we would continue that work. Um, and then of course, there's the, uh, the, uh, the decision uh, number three on whether to apply for assumption and that, not only would require approval from the governor and concurrence by the legislature, and obviously the legislative appropriation of those funds, uh, passage of the statute changes, et cetera, um, then we would move forward with that process. And that application package would also include a statement from the attorney general's office that, uh, that John mentioned earlier. Um, so the, I think the point is here that there would be several decisions um, yet to be made and kind of show where we're at in that process and what some of the steps are ahead of us. So, there's more detail on these steps um, in chapter five. They're, they're condensed a little bit here to, to be able to fit them on one slide, but there's some more details in chapter five if you'd like to look at it. So next slide, that's um, pretty much what I have here. So at this point, uh, if there's any, any, uh, any questions, comments, anyone have any thoughts, uh, I'd be happy to, happy to discuss more at this point. So, well, first of all, Thank you. I hope, Katie, I'm just checking you can hear me. Excellent presentation, uh, Les. Thank you so much for that presentation. I can see that board member uh, Forsberg, we're going to spend about, just so I set the expectations here, um, we're going to have uh, about 10 minutes of question time. Uh, from board members, and then we're going to have approximately uh, 10 minutes reserved for public comment. 
on the presentation of the 404 assumption study today. So um, I think that we can maybe stop screen sharing right now uh, for the time being to be able to see more board members for the discussion portion, because now I see that Commissioner Stroman also has her hand up. Um, let's, uh, board member Forsberg, I'm gonna call on you first, and then Commissioner Stroman will go to you next. Yes, uh, thank you, Chair. And as a county engineer, I've dealt with all of these permits a number of times over my career, the uh, DNR, Bowser, MPC, MPCA, and core permits. And uh, a number of years ago, the core permits were very slow. The core didn't have a staff. There was a very lengthy process. But as the years went by, they developed a series of general permits. And at this point, uh, the core permits are moving we along pretty smoothly. Uh, a couple of concerns I would have are when this is developed, that the state permit not be more stringent than the federal permit, which would slow down and make projects more expensive. And then also there are pretty significant costs here. Uh, even the annual cost of 4.8 million, who would pay that? Would that be uh, added to the current permit fees or would it be a state cost? So there are a number of important issues ahead of us yet. But very nice presentation. Uh, appreciate it very much. Thank you. So I don't know if someone has an answer to that question right now or if that's uh, yet to be determined. So um, less or- um, Yeah, I can, like the cost issue, um, that the report that we developed did not include recommendations for where the funds would come from. So the 2017 feasibility study did look at options for funding. Um, so there are some different options uh, discussed in that report. They did not recommend any in the 2017 study, but uh, there were some options discussed. So again, in our report, we did not identify, um, you know, the actual sources of the funds. And these, at this point, these are kind of essentially, um, you know, put a little context, a little more context behind it. You know, the 2017 feasibility study had some funding estimates that were very preliminary based on, um, you know, <laughs> we didn't have very much information about some of this stuff. So this is essentially do some more work, uh, do a little more, you know, figuring some of this out, I guess, how this would work, and then see if you can come up with some some um, adjusted or, or more accurate cost estimates, recognizing that there's still more work to do and that the final estimates would, you know, again, be adjusted when we have the full information. So to me, I think just to look at it from that perspective, it's just a step in that process to, to getting us closer to having more accurate funding estimates, but it did not go to that point of actually identifying sources. Okay. Um, all right, I, I'm gonna leave that there. Um, I think it is a outstanding question. There's also the balance of what uh, cost savings there might be by doing it this way, because I think that was in your earlier slides that that might be something taken into account as well in the long term. Uh, Commissioner Stroman. Thank you, um, Madam Chair, and thank you, uh, Les, for the great presentation, and thank you to the team for all of this work. And um, actually, I think the, the comment that I wanted to share on this maybe builds a little bit on um, Member Forsberg's question and, and Les's response to this, that I think, you know, one of the things that the team had to wrestle in, in doing this report is it's really difficult to come up with cost estimates when there are unknowns and, you know, how you make assumptions about those. And so I think the team did a really good job about being clear about what we know today and also what we don't know today and what would and identifying those issues or questions that would need resolution down the road if this process continues in order to continue to refine um you know not only the the costs um but also the you know kind of calculus right of of cost benefit and so i just i'm really appreciative to the team because i think it makes it um a more complete document for people to get that whole picture with being really clear about what we know and what assumptions went into those cost estimates as well as where some of the remaining questions and remaining work uh remains so thank you very much to the team for that yeah, thanks. It's definitely, uh, you know, I, I agree 100%. I think, uh, you know, we've done a lot of work and we've made a lot of progress, but on the other hand, you know, there's still a lot more to do and a lot more to figure out. So I, I definitely agree. 
other members i did do a check-in with executive director pratt right now there is not uh there's not an indication there's public comment on this item so i'm just going to remind people if you'd like to make public comment um uh, to use the process that we've outlined uh to get on a list and if there's not public comment we'll keep going with board member uh comment on the presentation today up until the appointed time uh i can see uh board member id tollefson uh would like to ask a question or make comment thank you um thank you madam chair i uh this was a really good presentation and i had a whole list of questions and you about every one of them, um, and uh, but I had a couple uh, a couple questions yet. One about funding, following on the previous two questions. I I know it's always a challenge to get our um, agencies properly funded, and I wondered what uh, observations you might have about budgeting for actual enforcement proceedings, because that's you know a great program is doesn't really work without adequate funding for enforcement. And I wonder if you can give me some perspective on that. Then I have one more question. Yeah, Mr. Enforcement, Long? Sure, um, and thank you. Enforcement is definitely part of the, um, it's kind of a top, complicated topic. It's part of the requirements of 404 assumptions. So we do definitely oh, have okay. to fund enforcement. Now the way it gets a little complicated on this topic because there are a lot of specific um, there are a lot of specific details and requirements in the 404 assumption regulations about enforcement and the enforcement authorities that have to be, that a state has to have. But those regulations also say that EPA can essentially approve an enforcement program or mechanism that has been shown to be effective. So in Minnesota, you know, I think we look at it and talking with EPA, um, you know, our conclusion is, is that we think we would maybe have to make some tweaks to some of our enforcement authorities, but for the most part, um, Minnesota has have has a an enforcement program that has been shown to be effective. So we, we don't think that there'd be a lot of changes necessary to our enforcement. Board member Ida Tolson? Yes. Oh, Keep yes, going. thank you, Madam Chair. I'm just calling oh. on you. <laughs> okay, thank you. I forget. Um, so, and so in the case of a 106 review for historic properties, who would do that then? So, um, it's actually under, in, under 404 assumption, it's actually EPA's responsibility. Okay, to, thanks. I, to I was handle, wondering about that. It's their response. Well, it's um, a little bit of a nuance here. It's their response, EPA's responsibility to handle historic properties and threatened endangered species. But um, the process to get it to them for review is sort of where there'd be a, a role for the state. So we would implement at, at the state kind of a, a, a screening process. So when we would have an application that comes through that hits certain criteria and, oh, yep, this one looks like it has the potential to have some impacts to historic properties or T&E review, that's when we could forward that application to EPA. So even though it's okay. their responsibility to handle and deal with it, um, there would be some screening that would occur through the state process. Okay, thanks very much. I have one more question, but I'm going to wait till everybody sure. else. <laughs> it appears that um, Chair Anderson Kelleher is, is got kicked out somehow of the meeting. Um, Commissioner, are you are you with us? Well, she's trying to to get back on. Why don't I put it over to I see um, Commissioner Kessler? You had your hand raised. I'll turn it to you for a comment. Yeah, thanks, uh, Katie. I couldn't figure out how to raise my hand, so um, it took me a while. And I just want to echo thanks to Les and the team. There was a lot of good coordination that happened across DNR, PCA, and Bowser on this and with EQB staff. Um, I also. Um, recognize that this is just the first of many steps. And if you look at the, <clears throat> excuse me, next steps listed at the end of this report, it's it's really the beginning of a journey and we're not even sure if we're, we're taking it yet. And so I guess my question, and I don't know who the question is for, is um, we, we, EQB sends this to the legislature as we send legislative reports and then 
prepare additional analysis if needed to make the decision on whether to pursue assumption. Who is making the decision on whether or not to pursue assumption in this in this series of events? Yeah, I can maybe answer that one, Commissioner. Um, the I think it's in the report too, but in essence, the executive. John, board, it's really hard to hear you still. So if you could speak okay, louder, that'd be great. I'm going to shout this out. Uh, I'm going to. I'm sorry. I don't know what's causing that problem, but. Uh, it's a good, very good question, Commissioner. And the, the short answer is that it would take an executive action to move forward, and it would take a legislative support for that as well. So, in essence, it takes both the executive and the legislative branch to take the next step and, and determine if, in fact, further pursuit would be a, a wise thing to do. I think that's really helpful to hear uh, Executive Jasper Jasky say. I think. Um, you know, we as a state, and I would say the pollution control agency in particular has gone through a number of um, high profile 401 certification and um, 404 permitting actions with the Corps of Engineers since this was put together. And um, I don't think that that work is getting any less controversial. And so I think it's, it's important to be really thoughtful in um, whether or not we as an executive branch are, are going to pursue this with the legislature. So just really appreciate that we are at the beginning of um, what may be several more steps that would take multiple years to, to pursue and that there's, there's room for coordination going forward as well. And thanks again to Les for facilitating uh, the coordination thus far and the discussion today. Madam Chair, it looks like we can't hear you. You appear to be unmuted. We can see you. Maybe leave and come back in. We'll try this one more time. In the meantime, um, members of the board, are there any further questions or comments on this topic? It looks like we do have, oh, we have one, and then we looks like we have one public commenter. So, um, Chair or uh, Board Member Eddie Thompson, I'll turn it to you, and then we'll go to our public commenter. Thank you, Katie. Um, my, my question had to do with how the uh, state assumption of Section 404 um, would affect uh, tribal water rights standards and legal appeals um, and how a tribal consultation would work. I know this isn't a simple question, and I appreciated the uh, the way that you did it, that you did address it in the report, um, and that there's more to go. But uh, I'm really interested in this um, piece. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. I can answer that. Um, so, 404 assumption does not apply on tribal lands. So. Um, the Corps of Engineers would still implement Section 404 of the Federal Clean Water Act on tribal lands. So that nothing would change in that respect from the way it currently operates where the state does not have authority on those lands. Um, as far as the tribal coordination, um, that's, you know, those are some of the details um, yet to be figured out. But one of the requirements in the, the um, 404, excuse me, 404 assumption regulations for coordination is you know, both with tribes and with other states is when there's a, um, a project that has the, the potential to have an effect on a neighboring or downstream state or tribe on their, their lands or their waters, then there has to be coordination on that permit. But some of those details, as far as uh, the you know, permit issuance, as well as you know, other aspects of coordination um, for a for an assumed program you know, would have to be worked out in this next step if we if we move forward. Thank you very much. Yep. I have a follow up question to that. Hey, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna attempt to see if you can hear me. Can you hear me? Oh, yeah. awesome. Okay. Uh, yes, board member Yawaki. I think that was you who had a follow up. Yeah, I was trying to find the raise hand function. Couldn't find it, but okay. Um, but yeah, I was looking at like uh, Fond du Lac. They've had assumption of 404 
uh, or they're working through that process. And so what would it look like um, to understand that there are tribal entities that are going to be taking over that assumption from the Army Corps? Mr. Um, well, yeah, so correct. Sorry, thank you. Um, so Fond du Lac, I know, has has been looking into it, investigating it. I don't know if they have made any decision to move forward or not. I haven't heard anything recently, um, but I know they have looked into assuming 404 in the past. Um, if a tribe to, in, in the state of Minnesota, for example, does decide to move forward and, and assume 404 and the state also did, um, we would coordinate with them just like we would. Uh, um, I, I think there'd be there'd be coordination both back and forth with that tribe um, in in as they implement their their permitting program and, and as we implement ours. So those obviously would be details we'd still have to figure out. But uh, I would imagine that the coordination would be would be increased in those situations. Okay. Yeah. No. I appreciate that. I just noticed in their um, documentation for their analysis. On the 404 assumption, they brought up these uh, adjacency issues and yeah. just wanted to make sure that that was, you know, like Kristen was talking about the tribal consultation is absolutely um, carved out before, uh, you know, an understanding is carved out before these issues arise. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Yep. Um, we do have uh, one public commenter. I also see uh, board member Forsberg's hand. And so uh, board member Forsberg, I'm going to ask you to come off of mute and speak and keep it kind of brief since we would like to get to that public commenter and then we are going to be closing this meeting and moving to the era subcommittee i believe next so um uh board member forsberg yes uh in addressing this to Les, uh did you coordinate with these three states that have taken over the 404 assumption has it been successful there has it been a positive thing there and then uh, do you have any rough guess if the state goes ahead with this, how many years we're talking about before it's implemented? Um, well, to the first question, yes, we have had some, uh, um, we have coordinated with the other states. So we've, we've talked with uh, both Michigan and New Jersey. In fact, um, they've even give during kind of earlier steps in this process, back when we were working on the 2017 feasibility study, they actually gave presentations uh, to us and to our stakeholders on how it works in their program, in their state. They've had it for many years. And um, from what we've been told and talking with them, they think it works very well and they've been very happy with it. Now, Florida is a little different situation because uh, they just assumed within the last year or so. So we did uh, coordinate and, and communicate with staff from Florida that were working on assumption um, prior to, or as they were working on that process, prior to actually uh, implementing the program, and then more recently, you know, they're still in that kind of initial phase of of um, implementation where it hasn't even been a year yet. I don't, I don't believe it's even been a full year since they've assumed. So, so a little early yet to know how things are going there. Um, again, just because they're still, I think, kind of in that process of of um, of gearing up to full implementation. Um, you know, the, what was the second part of your question again? I apologize. Um, uh, yes, do you have an estimate of how many years it would take for this? Oh, the years, correct. Years? Sorry. Yeah. Sorry about that. Um, yes, that, you know, that's hard to say, because um, let's just say if the legislature uh, provides some additional funding here this, this session, and we'd be looking at probably, you know, two to three years before we would finish um, working on, you know, developing the, the kind of the program development work that we're doing and the final cost estimates and the draft application materials. And then at that point is when a final decision would be made. Um, you know, then you're talking, you know, you're looking at uh, probably a couple of years for um, statute changes, rulemaking, kind of gearing up, et cetera, applying for the applying for 404 assumption, et cetera. And there's so many variables that really go into that. It's a little hard to make a, a um, a concrete or very, very solid estimate on the timeline because, you know, there's so many different things that could come up or, you know, the legislature or the governor's office or who, you know, could uh, have some additional questions or put things off, you know, so it's, it's um, a little tough to come up with a, a really accurate timeline, but at, I at hear the very Mr. least, we're talking down the road several years. 
I hear Mr. Lem saying his crystal ball on prediction of <laughs> being able to implement this is a little cloudy. So exactly, that's, that's to be understood, I think, in this situation. And um, I, I heard about five to 10 years myself. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's interesting. Yes. Um, okay. So we are going to move to public comment. And uh, as a reminder to members of the public who are listening and watching today, we are asking for public comment on the 404 assumption study. Uh, that is the item on the board's agenda today. And so uh, I'll ask folks who have been speaking to mute themselves. If you've spoken recently, just make sure you're muted. And I believe that faith is going to help us. And I believe the time frame, because we're already over time, uh, no more than two minutes uh, for the presenter, please, as we move into public comment. And then I'll come back on after the public comment. Faith? Thank you, Madam Chair. I will unmute Brian Martinson. Go ahead, Brian. Good afternoon. EQE uh, members, I'm Brian Martinson. I'm the Environment and Natural Resources Policy Analyst with the Association of Minnesota Counties, a membership organization representing all 87 counties. I just want to offer a brief statement. Um, we, as you know, counties serve a role in uh, the permitting and operation of our state Wetland Conservation Act. We have been very interested in the 404 assumption work. In fact, uh, we played a key role in introducing and advancing this, uh, the funding for this work and this report. I think we've been encouraged by um, the continued improvement in the, uh, the report work that has been done and the studies that have been done that make it seem like implementation of a 404 assumption program would be uh, increasingly more easy to implement as well as more affordable to implement. I imagine we will be interested in talking to all of you about potentially pursuing uh, legislation and uh, funding to continue the work of this program. Thank you for the opportunity to talk. Thank you, Mr. Martinson. We appreciate your comments today. Um, members, I just want to note for the record that both Mr. Huff joined us from the Department of Health, as well as Mr. McKinnon uh, from DEED, uh, and this should be noted such in the minutes that they were here as uh, proxies for their commissioners. Members, we have reached the end of our formal EQB agenda. And so I'm going to look for a motion to adjourn this meeting, but please remember members of the ARA subcommittee do stick around. Other board members are welcome to sit in on that meeting as well if you wanna stay connected. Uh, but we are going to take the motion to adjourn the EQB meeting uh, at this point. Do I have a motion of a board member? Commissioner Kessler, are you trying to get off mute? I think you are. Yes, okay. yes, uh, Chair Kelleher, I will make that motion. Okay, uh, Commissioner Kessler moves to adjourn the meeting. A second? Chair, I'll second. Thank you, Commissioner Stroman. Okay, uh, board members, please come off mute for a uh, oral vote. All those in favor of adjournment, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed, no. The motion prevails and our meeting is now adjourned. I'm going to hand the virtual gavel over to Commissioner Stroman at this point. And thank you to Bowser for the presentation today. Madam Chair and board members, thank you for the opportunity. Thanks, Les. Bye. All right, Commissioner Stroman, I'll probably just give you a second to get organized here. All right, perfect. I've I've found my uh, mute button, so I'm off mute. And uh, with that, I will call to order the meeting of the EQB's Environmental Review Implementation Subcommittee, or ARIS. Uh, again, I'm Sarah Stroman. I'm the Commissioner of the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources and Chair of the ARIS. Um, we will start with a roll call of members. And so, Faith, I'm going to ask if you can call the roll of the subcommittee members. 
Thank you, Chair Stroman. First, I have board member Margaret, excuse me, well, Commissioner Margaret Anderson Kelleher. I am present. Commissioner Grace Arnold. I believe Louise Miltich was going to be a proxy here. Is that right? I'll move on. Public member Kristen ID Tollefson. Present. Public member Alan Forsberg. Present. And I believe Commissioner Katrina Kessler is excused. I'm I'm here, Faith. Oh, you are? Okay. Apologies. Commissioner Jan Malcolm, I believe, is excused. However, Assistant Commissioner Dan Huff is here. Is that right? Public member Brian Murdoch. And Chair Stroman, we know you are here. Public member Ben Yawaki. Present. And that is the entire list, Madam Chair. Okay, well, thank you. And then I will acknowledge that um, some of our EQB board members uh, have remained on uh, to listen in on the discussion. So thank you um, for your interest and in, in staying on. Um, next on our agenda is the approval of the consent agenda. And um, we have the meeting minutes from July 22nd, 2021. That's the ARIS meeting minutes. And we have the um, agenda, proposed agenda for today, January 19th, 2022. Uh, so a motion would be in order on the adoption of the consent agenda with the uh, agenda and minutes. Is there a motion? I will I move up. Al Forsberg. I will second uh, board member Forsberg. Okay, so moved by uh, member Forsberg and seconded by Commissioner Anderson Kelleher. Any discussion on the motion? Uh, hearing none or not seeing any hands, um, I'm gonna uh, ask that folks unmute uh, so we can have a voice vote and all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, no opposition. The motion carries the consent agenda and minutes are adopted. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll now move to agenda item number three and I will before um, we dive into this just also take the opportunity to remind uh, folks listening in here today that we will have time for public comment after the presentation on the pilot program framework. And so if you can please use the raise hand feature to indicate that you would like to provide public comment, um, we'll, we'll do it that way. And I will just note um, that I think some people are um, trying to, having a little bit of a struggle finding the raise hand button. Um, I know I was one of them and after several attempts, I finally found it, but um, at least the way I did it and uh, director, Pratt, you can correct me if I'm wrong here, but I displayed the participants hovered over my name. There we go. There's the there's the instructions. And then there was a um, a hand there. So um, hopefully that's working for folks. And um, at this point, then for the presentation on the pilot program and framework metrics, I'm going to hand it off to the chair of the subcommittee on pilot program implementation, Nick Martin. Thank you, Chair Stroman, and uh, thanks to the members of the ARIS uh, subcommittee for the chance to talk today. Um, I am Nick Martin. I'm the public member for Congressional District 4, um, and I have been chairing the subcommittee uh, for pub pilot program implementation, which we're about to talk about. Um, my fellow committee members are Commissioner Grace Arnold um, and uh, Louise Miltich may be here on her behalf. Um, Alan Forsberg, public member from uh, Congressional District 1. Mehmet Conor Steenberg, public member from Congressional District 5, and Benjamin uh, Yawaki, public member from Congressional District 3. So thanks to all my fellow committee members. 
Um, I'm going to say a little bit about the process we've been through over the past couple of months and then uh, turn it over to Denise Wilson to to walk through um, a memo that's in your packet. Um, but just as a reminder, the, the, the purpose of the pilot program uh, that I'm going to talk to you about today is to assess the effectiveness and efficiency of new climate information that's included on the draft EAW used in the environmental review program. And uh, the board decided by resolution last September that the, that the EAW should be revised to include climate information, including both uh, questions around carbon footprint analyses and questions around climate impacts um, in the, in the uh, area of proposed projects. Um, but, but didn't really decide on the final form of the EAW. We, we decided that a pilot program would be really useful and we, to work with all the users of the EAW. So that includes uh, RGUs, uh, responsible government units, project proposers, consultants, and the public um, to really test these climate uh, questions out on real projects. Um, you know, answer questions like, are, are we getting usable climate information? Usable means different things to different users of the form. Um, and does it allow project proposers and RGUs to efficiently provide that info or are additional clarifications, guidance, or tools uh, needed? Um, and then finally, you know, also through the pilot program, we really want to provide some opportunities for mutual learning for RGUs and for public engagement. So those are the things we're trying to do in the pilot program. Um, EQB also convened uh, the, this uh, subcommittee for pilot program implementation. And we met um, late November and early December of last year. Uh, those meetings were open to the public and provided time for public comment. Um, at our November meeting, we focused primarily on questions of pilot program design. So like who should participate, recruitment strategy, what were the expectations? What would the public engagement opportunities be within the pilot? Um, and the key questions really discussed in that meeting were around how to ensure that uh, greater Minnesota RGUs would have a chance to participate, especially those that maybe are not working on an EAW or have limited staffing to participate. Um, how would we ensure opportunities for learning? So some ideas around cohort meetings and a guest speaker series came out of that. And how would we ensure public transparency? Um, in our second meeting, which was early December, we turned really to the question of metrics. How should we assess effectiveness and, and efficiency? Uh, what kind of information should be collected from pilot program participants? Um, and and just, to, just to be specific, we, we really defined effectiveness in terms of does the EAW form accurately and consistently provide usable climate information, usable to project proposers, RGUs, and the public. And we defined efficiency in terms of, does it provide the ability to supply the, the, the data that RGUs are requesting um, and uh, for RGUs to conduct their environmental review in a cost-effective and timely manner, relevant to the sort of specifics of the project at hand? And then finally, we talked about some metrics for just sort of pilot program design. Again, things like, like uh, public engagement, uh, involvement from greater Minnesota RGUs, um, and so on. Um, the, the key points that we discussed in that second meeting and have discussed since that time are really around what's the best way to engage project proposers who are preparing an EAW to make sure we're getting their perspective. Um, and uh, how, do, how do we consider time and cost? There's a lot of concern about time and cost and making this process efficient, but there's also some challenges, um, which I think Denise will talk about in, in terms of, um, you know, uh, assessing time and cost in a useful way, considering great variability across projects, project types, project sizes, as well as the learning curve in doing this the first time that may not reflect the time and cost kind of needed to do it once it's become more routine. Um, so the memo that's in your packet it's on page 16 kind of walks through those things, metrics, uh, pilot program design, and uh, Denise Wilson is going to walk through that and then we'll have time for some discussion. Um, but the last thing I want to say is um, we'll have further opportunity. This pilot program is ongoing from now through September and we'll have further, further opportunities for the for the subcommittee for pilot program implementation to be engaged, 
as well as to update ARIS, AQB, and the public on how the, the pilot program is, is uh, progressing. Um, between September and December, that's the time frame when staff will be uh, analyzing findings and, and considering potential adjustments to the EAW form to improve effectiveness and efficiency. And then they will be presenting a final EAW form to the board for approval uh, in December. So um, that's my introduction. And um, I, I'd like to turn it over now to Denise Wilson to sort of dig into some of the specifics that are in the, uh, in the memo. And as I said, that's starting page 16 of your packet. Well, thank you, public member um, Martin. And um, good afternoon, Madam Chair and members of the Environmental Review Implementation Subcommittee. For members of the audience, my name is Denise Wilson and I work for the Environmental Quality Board as the Director of the State Environmental Review Program. And on behalf of the Subcommittee for Pilot Program Implementation, I'm going to talk about the pilot program design and metrics. Next slide, please. So as public member Martin mentioned, after an extensive engagement process that provided broad feedback on draft changes to include climate information on the Environmental Assessment Worksheet, or EAW, board members heard concerns that responsible governmental units, or RGUs, and project proposers need time to get familiar with these new technical assessments. In response to those concerns, board members directed EQB staff to implement a pilot program to test the changes before the board makes a final decision on what changes are needed. The desired outcome from the pilot program is for board members to receive input from the trial of the draft EAW to inform the, the, that board decision to better understand if the proposed changes effectively result in usable climate information for diverse audiences and whether project proposers and responsible governmental units or RGUs are able to efficiently provide consistent and accurate climate information. For the rest of my presentation, I'm going to provide more detail on how the pilot program will be implemented and what information will be collected for board member consideration. Next slide, please. The pilot program will be implemented from January through the end of September, providing the opportunity for all interested parties to consider how projects will be reviewed using the draft revised EAW form and guidance. EQB staff will provide support through learning by hosting a monthly speaker session that will be open to all and convening monthly cohort meetings where RGUs and consultants will be able to ask questions and engage with other registered pilot program participants. They will also collect input from anyone using the draft revised EAW form and considering that climate information. And finally, EQB staff will summarize the input for members of the Subcommittee for Pilot Program Implementation, or SPPI. Members of the SPPI will consider all input received and make final recommendations to board members based on their assessment of that input. Next slide, please. During the pilot program, there will be multiple ways to participate in using and or reviewing climate information provided on the draft revised EAW form, depending on how you currently engage with the Environmental Review Program. RGUs can volunteer to use the draft revised EAW form to evaluate proposed projects. If an RGU registers to participate in the pilot program, project proposers will be asked to provide project information, information using the draft revised EAW form and consider the climate assessments during their project design. Consultants hired by the project proposer and or RGU can provide technical support with implementing the climate assessment. And members of the public can review projects during the public comment period and consider the climate information. Everyone will have the opportunity to provide input about their experience by responding to surveys that will be developed for each of these groups. Next slide, please. In addition, EQB staff will provide opportunities for anyone interested to stay actively engaged with the pilot program. As I mentioned earlier, EQB staff will be hosting a monthly speaker series where attendees can learn and be supported as they go through the environmental review process. 
The first three speakers we have queued up include in February, Bar Engineering will share their experience using the guidance developed by the climate technical team to prepare the example analysis included in the final recommendation report. In March, we've asked Jeff Hoke, an air quality consultant, to give an overview of the Department of Transportation tool, MICE, um, which is a Minnesota-specific tool, greenhouse gas calculator, developed for reviewing highway projects. And in April, Amelia Voss has uh, graciously agreed to provide um, her perspective on how the Minnesota Center for Environmental Advocacy will use the climate information that, that will appear in the EAWs. From there, we will take an adaptive approach and provide speakers based on the needs identified during the pilot program. Sorry, I... Okay. So for um, anyone interested can also attend board and subcommittee, subcommittee meetings to stay up to date. In addition to the, to the speaker series, RGUs and consultants will have the opportunity to attend cohort meetings designed to support collaboration, share best practices, and to learn from one another. Next slide, please. Pilot program metrics were developed to establish a foundational basis for board members and EQB staff to determine effectiveness of climate information and efficiency for providing the climate information included on the draft revised EAW form, as well as assessing the pilot program design. The metrics will help board members consider if the questions included on the draft revised EAW form meet the intended purpose of the environmental review program for understanding the potential environmental effects of a proposed project. While we hope to gather a robust set of information, we recognize going into the pilot program that there will be limitations to the amount and type of information we can obtain. The information collected will not answer all board member questions, and much of the information collected will be qualitative and based on who volunteers to participate as well as who responds to the surveys. Also, we cannot account for all future scenarios, and so we cannot know in advance how many projects and what project types will use the draft revised EAW form. However, we will do our best to ensure that anyone wishing to provide input has an opportunity. For the purposes of the pilot program, as um, board member Martin mentioned, um, Effectiveness is defined as the EAW form accurately and consistently providing usable climate information to project proposers, RGUs, and members of the public. And efficiency is defined as the ability of project proposers to supply any data reasonably requested by the RGU and the ability of the RGU to comply with the environmental review procedures in a cost-effective and timely manner, relevant to project-specific needs. Next slide, please. Information on the pilot program will be regularly updated on the EQB project webpage. In addition, the webpage includes opportunities to join an email distribution list where you'll receive email updates and notifications and also to sign up to receive um, notifications via the EQB Monitor newsletter. Next slide, please. Here is the overall project timeline. So again, from January through September, we will support participants in the pilot program and collect information and provide updates during board and subcommittee me meetings. Um, starting September through November, um, we will compile and share information received from surveys. And then finally, in December, the Subcommittee for Pilot Program Impl Implementation will present a final EAW form to the board. Next slide, please. So here's my contact information. If you have any specific questions, um, please feel free to reach out and um, either send me an email or give me a call. Thank you.
All right, sorry, I was just pausing to make sure that um, Denise, you were done and uh, that Chair Martin, you didn't want to add anything else. Um, thank you very much for the very informative presentation. And moreover, thank you to the subcommittee for really some thoughtful work on this. Um, Chair Martin, I also want to thank you for, in your opening remarks, really clearly laying out the purpose of um, the pilot and, and the evaluation methods. And I think particularly the reminder that the purpose of the pilot is really to um, help the EQB understand whether the changes that we've suggested to the EAW form um, provide helpful information, not whether uh, climate information should be included on the EAW form. And I think that was um, a really helpful distinction, both in the subcommittee's memo and, and in your laying it out. And, and I think the other piece is just um, the reminder that you both gave that the, the data we're going to get out of this and, and as we go through the evaluation really is more qualitative than quantitative. And, um, you know, as a as working in an agency that has uh, a lot of data and information that we use, I think being clear about when we have, you know, very uh, solid quantitative data and we sort of get an output uh, very clearly at the end of that versus qualitative data, which is, you know, um, still really useful in, in helping ARIS and EQB make informed decisions, but isn't necessarily going to give us, you know, an answer. Um, so I appreciate you you laying out that that context really clearly. And, you know, I think there's just a tremendous amount of uh, work on the part of the subcommittee represented here. So, and I know that I've heard from our and our team that we're already teeing up the new form for some upcoming projects and um, getting ready for the pilot. So uh, appreciate that we're at this stage. At this time, um, I'd like to ask uh, board members if anybody has any clarifying questions and then um, we will uh, move into the public input and then have some time for additional subcommittee discussion after the public input, after we've had a chance to hear um, from, from external folks, but do want to give folks a chance if there are any clarifying questions at this time. Does look like member Forsberg, you have your hand up. Okay, we may have some audio issues with member Forsberg. So I'm gonna, um, while we're figuring that out, um, move to Commissioner Kessler, who also has her hand up and then we'll um, come back to, to member Forsberg. Thank you, Commissioner Stroman, and thank you for helping me figure out how to raise my hand. So um, I feel like I have learned something today. Uh, also, thank you to the work group. This is a really important, step forward and um, appreciate the thoughtful uh, effort gone into thinking about how we can support our local partners in how we do this well together. Um, one of the questions, and I will just echo what Commissioner Sherman said. I said, I know that we within the MPCA are thinking about how to actively integrate this into the work we're doing um, at where we are the RGU. And I'm wondering, is there an official kickoff date where like everything that happens beyond this date We'll use the new form. I don't know. I, I, I feel like I've been asked that question and I didn't know the answer, so I'm asking it and I'm sorry if that's a silly question. I think it's a good question. Denise, can you answer that? Yes, um, Madam Chair, um, today. Today is the kickoff date, so. <laughs> yeah. Well, timely then, thank you. <laughs> thank you for that. Madam Chair. This is Katie and I can maybe just add add one other thing with that, which is as we've been talking to RGUs, we realize that each RGU has a slightly different process for onboarding projects into their environmental review process. And so there is some discretion there for RGUs to onboard projects in the way that makes sense with their workflow. Thank you for that. It does look like uh, member Forsback is, uh, Forsberg is back with us. So, <laughs> Ellen, if, if your audio is working this time, I know you had your hand raised. Yes, I, I believe it is. Can you hear me, uh, Sarah? You're great now. Yes, thank you. Okay. First, I'd like to thank Nick for the great job he did of chairing the subcommittee, especially working with some of the less disciplined members, such as myself, perhaps. Much appreciated. I think the subcommittee did a good job in uh, moving forward the idea that the 
project proposers need to be considered uh, through this. And then also the idea that uh, the numbers may not be perfect, but it's better to have numbers and estimates on time and cost than not to have any idea at all. Uh, and I, I think Nick mentioned this too. I think it's important that the subcommittee stay involved as the project moves forward. Uh, there will be a transmittal letter, I would assume, to these pilot projects to explain the context uh, of climate change and, and where this fits into it. And then also in the evaluation phase of it. Thanks, Member Forsberg, for that. It, it, it's been great working with you and the whole uh, subcommittee. And um, I agree with you that I, I'm, I'm really um, happy with the, where we ended up on, on clarifying those questions around project proposal involvement and um, you know doing what we can on time and cost, recognizing some of the limitations there. Um, I think that um, I'm, I'm looking forward to the SPPI continuing to be in, be engaged and get kind of periodic updates uh, so that, you know, we can uh, learn as we go and modify if we need to. I don't know if Denise, you want to say anything more about that, but. No, I, I think that's a, a good assessment. Great, thank you. Any other um, members have Question clarifying questions at this point. Again, we will come back for more discussion following the public input opportunity. All right, I'm not seeing any. Um, Nick and Denise, you did such a great job, maybe with the um, presentation. Oh, it looks like Ben has his hand raised. I'm sorry. Yeah, no, I apologize. Um... I realized I had to use the raise hand function and uh, <laughs> um, yeah, no, but my question um, was just like a further clarification that I had with the question I'd asked at the last meeting that we had was just about when we'd be notified. I know you, you said today's the starting day, but um, you know, where we'll be filled in as members of the SPPI on some of those um, proposer meetings. Uh, Madam Chair, um, I think that, you know, our plan is to um, have folks who want to stay informed. We, we've created um, an email list through Gov Delivery. And so every time there's a, a meeting where um, the pilot program will be discussed or um, when the, the speakers uh, meetings come up or the cohort meetings, we're planning to reach out through those distribution lists. We're, for the speaker series, we're planning to post notifications in the EQB um, monitor newsletter. And um, in addition, each time uh, we send one of those emails, we will make sure that all um, SPPI members and ARIS members and actually full, the full board um, receives those notifications too and invitations to attend um, the speaker sessions. The, the cohort meetings are intended to just be limited to RGUs who are going through the process and consultants. And so that, that allows them to sort of have that learning opportunity in a, a safe space. Okay, I, my assumption was that it was gonna be closed to like public members, but that it would be open to SPPI members. But thanks for that clarification. Sure. I'm just pausing to see if there are any other hands raised. I've I've now popped up my participants list, which is a little bit easier to scan for hands raised. I'm not seeing any. Um, so let's um, go ahead then and and move to the public input portion. Um, we always welcome uh, as the Environmental Review Implementation Subcommittee. Uh, to have members of the public uh, share their their reflections on the topics we're discussing and would be happy to hear any thoughts related to the pilot program framework and indicators. Um, Director Pratt, I believe a minute ago, as of a minute ago or a couple minutes ago, we did not have any commenters in the queue, but I do want to make uh, one last call if folks uh, want to weigh in or if there's someone now, um, what we will be following the guidelines provided on page one of the EQB or the ARIS, I'm sorry, meeting packet. 
or you can raise your hand in WebEx. Madam Chair, it looks like we have a couple commenters now and I'll, I'll turn it to Faith to queue those up. Great, thank you. Thank you, we'll start with Amelia Voss. Go ahead, Amelia. Can all hear me? We can hear Great. you, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, this is Amelia Voss, regulatory attorney from Minnesota Center for Environmental Advocacy. Um, and just a few thoughts. I know um, for those of you who are on the SPPI, you heard my comments about and cautions about collecting um, qualitative data. So I appreciate seeing some of the qualifications to that, or I'm sorry, quantitative data. And I appreciate seeing some of the qual qualifications to that data and a recognition of the limitations of that data um, in this in this packet on page 20. So I just wanted to say that I think that was a good um, compromise based on the discussion at the last SPPI meeting. And then I just wanted to highlight two things. Um, I think it would be valuable to add a question to, um, to the effectiveness metrics that could go to both the RGUs and the members of the public that asks, um, whether those two groups are able to assess how the climate impacts relate to local, state, and or federal policies. Um, you know, I think that is going to be an important component of this information, especially going forward as further and further climate plans are enacted on the local level, um, you know, and climate policies are enacted either at the state level or the federal level, it's going to be important for our, especially our RGUs as they make decisions to understand how this information relates to those policies or at some point they may become, um, you know, legislative mandates. So, and I also think that as a member of the public, that's really critical that we're able to have the information that would show us how that relates to those policies that have either been adopted at a local level, or local level or at the state level. Um, so that's just one piece that I I thought was missing. And then um, my other comment is that, you know, I um, have often talked about the environmental review participants as sort of a three-legged stool with project proposers, RGUs, and members of the public. And on the metrics as presented, the public is only engaging on two of the metrics, um, effectiveness metric three, I'm sorry, effectiveness metric two and five. And so um, knowing that, you know, members are the, of the public are one third of the, of the picture here, I think it's um, very critical that the survey that's issued to members of the public under effectiveness metric five asks some key questions um, and just to offer up some suggestions i think it's important that the public is able to weigh in on whether the questions were answered sufficiently to provide usable information that's something i've raised before that sometimes um questions are answered with what i would deem as a non-answer and i think it's important for the public to be able to weigh in on whether they feel the questions were sufficiently answered to provide that usable information. Um, I think the public should also be able to reflect on whether there was other climate information that they felt was critically needed and not provided. And then um, lastly, I think it's important for the public to be able to weigh in on whether the forum provided usable information about mitigation options for emissions. And I just want to say a brief piece about that in that <clears throat> as we look at this information and as we gather this information on on individual projects i see providing the public with mitigation opportunities as kind of an exciting path forward for an environmental review that could get us out of a place of um you know we oppose this project because it has climate impacts to we could support this project if you know it adopts the low hanging fruit of greenhouse gas mitigations that could also have real long term benefits for the project. I think having that mitigations discussion can create a path forward and a compromise path forward that's often been lacking from environmental review discussions, which often end up being kind of a, a polar discussion of yay to the project or nay to the project. And I think in the context of climate, making sure that the public is aware of mitigation opportunities 
could often create a path where multiple groups are getting TS on a project instead of being stuck at a standstill of yay or nay. And so um, I just wanted to add that because I think that's, even though the mitigations don't seem maybe like as fundamental as quantifying the greenhouse gas emissions, I think they actually are going to be really important for helping find some common ground and paths moving forward as all of our communities in Minnesota and all of these projects are grappling with climate. Thank you for those comments, Amelia, appreciate it. Faith, um, do we have someone else in line? Yes. And and let me just ask how many we have, because um, I know we were going to try to keep folks to a time limit based on um, only having so much time for this and a number of commenters. If if we only have a couple more, we'll um, manage. But I, otherwise, um, we do want to start trying to um, make sure folks have, have equal time, but also that we get everybody in. Thank you, Madam Chair. We have three more commenters. And we might have one coming in through the chat as well. Okay. Um, so I would just request if folks can keep their um, comments to, uh, you know, two to three minutes. That's great. If you um, need to expand a little bit, since we didn't start that way, you know, we'll we'll make do. But um, we do want to make sure that everybody who's here and wants to share thoughts with us has the opportunity to do that. So Faith, if you can queue up the next person, that'd be great. Yes, next we have Jeff, and I'm I'm not gonna say your net last name correctly, but I will unmute you now. Actually, your name just dropped down. Maybe Jeff is no longer. Oh, there you are again. Okay. You are now unmuted, Jeff. Jeff Medechek, nobody can say it, don't worry. Uh, this is a quick question for I don't know if it's for Denise or for someone else. You know, in relation to number two, it it asks about were people able to understand the climate information requested? So is there is there any thoughts within the pilot program that there may be some uh, standardized ways that will want that will come out of the program as how uh, new climate information needs to be presented? You know, when I reviewed the uh, revised draft EAW form last year sometime, it looked it showed places where additional data about climate was going to be added. But you know, as to right now, those of us that work for consultants or project proposers or as consultants for RGUs don't necessarily know how to answer those questions with the additional information. So is there any thought about laying out some level of standard of the amount or type or way of the information should be presented to answer those questions? Madam Chair, I, I can answer that yeah, question. I was, Denise, I was going to ask you if you could take a crack at answering that, please. So it, it is a challenge and I, you know, I acknowledge it's a, it's a, a very good question because um, right now, the way the program operates is um, the, the RGU has discretion for determining what information is needed and how those assessments are completed based on project specific details um, and the nature and location of that project. And so there we acknowledge there will be variability among the, the need for that information. And so coming up with an expectation that every project will answer that question in the same way is challenging. And also the other part of the challenge is that um, different individuals will determine what is usable information for them. And so overall, that question was really meant to sort of do to prompt that self reflection and to report out whether or not they felt an individual felt that it provided usable information. We could, um, you know, again, do some uh, more of a qualitative, um, you know, capture of information so that if someone answered um, no to that question, we could ask them to to give us a little bit more detail or information about what they feel might have been usable climate information that, that was not included. Thank you, Denise, for that response. Faith, do you wanna um, 
unmute the next commenter, please. Sure, next we have John Tell, and I'm gonna unmute you. Go ahead, go ahead, John. In Grand Rapids, Minnesota. Uh, the question I have is really for the state agencies that have the capacity for rulemaking. Is there any template contemplated for rulemaking initiatives that will have some impact on climate change or climate change mitigation. This might be a good time, and I'm, of course, for uh, uh, our interest, probably most interested in any future rulemaking regarding non-ferrous minerals. Um, well, John, thank thank you for that question. I think two things. One is um, this conversation and this public input opportunity is really focused on the climate um, related changes to the EAW form, and so any agency rulemaking that might be related to or separate from that really is outside the scope of what the subcommittee is contemplating. Right now, I think certainly um, I will just say from from DNR's perspective and to the to the topic um, you raised, I'm certainly happy to to chat with you offline um, about and and I'm assuming you're aware of our um, review that we're undertaking um, per per court instruction. But um, I'm happy to have a conversation with you offline. I don't know if John is still unmuted, um, but I, I will. I, I think his question we can address from from DNR's standpoint um, with him. I don't. I don't believe it's related to to this particular discussion. Faith, do we have any more uh, folks lined up to either uh, unmute and provide a comment, or did something come in through the chat? We received two questions in the chat. So we'll start with one from Kylie Beard. Um, it says to clarify the pilot study begins today, but a new a EAW form will not be available until after the climate pilot program is complete. Is that correct? Madam chair, I can um, take that question. So the draft revised EAW form is available on the website as, as well as the, the guidance. And so it is anticipated and expected that if um, an RGU or responsible governmental unit um, registers for the pilot program, that they would use that form for projects that they review during this time period. And we, we realize there's some overlap. And I, I think it was mentioned earlier that the DNR and I know that MPCA have had projects that began ahead of today. <clears throat> but that may be using the form. And so just um, for our purposes, for making sure that we collect the data in a sort of systematic way, we've identified today as, you know, the, the kickoff date, but we'll actually be collecting data for any project that gets public noticed during this time period. And so in that, that'll start from today and the EQB monitor next week as well as um, it running through the end of September. And it, it really just, how it, anyone can use the form, even if you're not a registered um, RGU, but it, it helps us target for um, sort of the boundaries around the data that we'll be collecting. Thank you, Denise. Um, Faith, did you say we had another question in the chat? Yes, we do. This one is from Jesse, and I, I don't know how to pronounce Jesse's last name. Um, but Jesse asks, I was curious if the pilot program received enough volunteers to participate and provide an accurate overview of how this update will impact non-state entities. If I remember correctly, it seemed most of the volunteers were that of state agencies. So, Madam Chair, I can answer that. And um, 
because some RGUs, especially local RGUs, or, or actually any RGU, really doesn't know what projects are coming forward until they're actually proposed. And so uh, we've asked those governmental units to, to register to participate. And if a project happens during this time frame, to use the new form. Not everyone will have an active EAW during this time period. Um, and because of that, we're, we're leaving um, enrollment or registration open throughout the, the time period. Again, but the data that we'll collect, we'll only be able to collect it for an EAW that was um, using the, the form and then put on public notice during this time frame. And so I can share that we have right now 17 local responsible governmental units that have registered, and those are 17 distinct, but we also have multiple people within those, those governmental units that have registered. We have 22 consultants and we have all state RGUs um, registered. Thank Madam you. Chair, we don't appear to have any more commenters except that John Chell's hand is still raised. So I'm curious, um, John, if you have an additional question, I'm going to unmute your microphone now. Go ahead, John. Oh, my apologies. Uh, I have no question. And Sarah, thank you for the comprehensive uh, answer. So I apologize. And frankly, I don't know how to unraise my hand. Oh, <laughs> there we go. That, that did it, John. Congratulations, and and thank you for um, for your understanding. And and uh, either Assistant Commissioner Bob Meyer and I will follow up with you. So, um, well, thank you uh, for the folks who were here and provided uh, either comments or uh, questions. As we move into discussion of the subcommittee, um, and that that discussion really is to consider recommendations from. The SPPI uh, from the the overview we got from Denise and and the feedback we got from the public. I think it might just be helpful um, to some of the suggestions and and feedback we heard here today from the public. It might be helpful, um, Denise and and Chair Martin, not to put you on the spot, but just for the for you to share from the SPPI's uh, perspective. Um, how the what we've heard here today was was considered or not um, by the subcommittee, so that the rest of ARIS just has a, a sense of um, have those comments that were raised today already are they issues that the subcommittee already addressed and and how I think that would be helpful, and then we'll move to broader subcommittee discussion. Um, Madam Chair, I can I can make a, a first attempt. I I think. Um, from my takeaways from today is, you know, it's it's really important that we ask the right questions in the survey, and that we make sure that we compile it in a way is that that is meaningful for for board members. And um, we've captured notes from today, and will um, absolutely be amenable to to adding those questions, and any other questions that um, members of ARIS might have. But I, you know, again, from from the other discussion, I, I think we've anticipated and um, the the proposed um, framework actually will accommodate those concerns such as the discussion about time and cost and how that information will be collected and presented. Uh, thanks, uh, Chair Stroman. I guess um, two, maybe two things that I would add to that. First of all, um, Jeff M., with the long last name, uh, sorry, Jeff, um, asked a question around, you know, can, how, how do we help uh, people working with this form answer questions and is there a standardized way? And I, we, we have talked a bit about that. I, I think it's challenging because there's so many, the EAW form is trying to be general for so many different types of projects that it's difficult in the form to say, if you know, do it this way because your project may or may not even affect a particular emission source, right? Uh, but what I what I did want to say is so while the questions in the in the form are um, a little bit at a more general level, you know, around carbon impacts, sort of greenhouse gas footprint of your project, and climate uh, trends expected in the area of your project, um, 
th there, um, the state agencies have done a, a really strong job, I think, of trying to provide guidance and tools for those things. So obviously, if somebody is coming to it talking about a specific project, they know exactly where that project is. They can use some of those tools uh, to to look at what climate impacts might be uh, expected in that region. I think they're pretty usable, actually. But um, but but I I do think that one of the um, one of the really key goals of the pilot program is to is to learn where you know more guidance is needed, and you know consistent with obviously staff limitations that EQB and the other agencies may have to be able to provide more tools if um, if it's not clear how best to answer answer questions. And then if the, if the questions on the form itself could be made clearer um, because people are struggling to understand what a question means to make those kind of changes. So, so we are really trying to, um, you know, not, as Chair Stroman said, not we're not talking about whether or not to have climate questions on the form. That decision has been made, but we are talking about, you know, how can this these questions be made clear and, and, and sufficient guidance be provided. So that's certainly something that may evolve through the pilot program and that, you know, pilot program between now and December, there may be changes or additional tools that are provided. So that was one thought and, that, and I wanted to, you know, we, we have talked a bit about that and I, 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 I know that's the intent of EQB staff to continue thinking about that. Um, the other thing, um, uh, Ms. Voss mentioned the, the sort of important roles of project proposers, RGUs, and the public as sort of the three uh, actors or three legs of the stool in the environmental review program. We had quite a bit of discussion around that, and I think that um, it is really important for to consider, you know, for the pilot program to consider how this information is usable uh, and used by um, all three of those actors. Um, but we also recognized in a lot of our discussions, you know, the people that are directly trying to figure out how to answer questions and use the tools are the project proposers and the RGUs. So we, we want to make sure that from those two entities, we're, we're getting their impressions about what can be made clearer or, or easier about the process. Um, and then, of course, it's equally important then is, is the public getting the information it wants out of the um, out of the the resulting process, but the public is not actually answering the questions. So we have, you know we kind of recognize that distinction, and that's that's uh, that was behind a lot of the discussion we had about how to make sure that uh, we're hearing from project proposers and RGUs who are actually you know using the form and and you know finding it easy or difficult to use, and what would they suggest to us. Thank you very much for both of you for sharing those thoughts. I think it'll just provide some helpful context as the the uh, ARIS group here discusses. Um, I see that uh, Director Pratt has her hand raised. So before we move into discussion, Director Pratt, I will call on you. Yeah, thanks, Madam Chair. And I'll just add to, to the two previous comments that as I've been discussing this with the staff team and with SCPI members, uh, another thing to note is just that this is an adaptive learning exercise. We do, we have designed and laid out in the memo to the best of our understanding at this point, what is the best way to approach this? But we might learn along the way, say we get a few months into this pilot program and we recognize, hey, there's an additional question here that we could ask that might give useful information. Or there's another conversation that we need to be having to help fill in some of the gaps we can do those things. We'll we'll do what we can to kind of follow the information that we think is coming out of this process, and that's going to be useful to the board. So it's that that balance of you know having a smart design, but also being flexible to what we're learning along the way. Thank you for adding that. That's that's really helpful because I think you know obviously that's that's part of the value I think we all saw in doing the pilot in the first place. And so to to know if, you know, we encounter a gap um, and, and see something we can adapt, I think that's really helpful. Um, so I want to open up this discussion to members of uh, ARIS. Uh, if folks have thoughts on uh, what has come forward from SPPI uh, or what you've heard from members of the public today and um, we can we'll have some discussion and then any thoughts we want to share uh, back as as we um, 
as Director Pratt said, uh, go into adaptive mode and, and continue to refine the pilot program framework. Commissioner Kessler, are you raising your hand? I see your video turn on, so I'm assuming your hand is coming next. I, I just, I know it's like painful to sit there when you ask a question and nobody responds. So I was just at least acknowledging that I have heard your question. I don't know that I have any um, specific thoughts other than what we've talked about, but I appreciate the work of the subgroup and Nick did a really in-depth job in leading that. And I think we're well positioned to move forward. And so um, just letting you know that People can hear you and and see you and appreciate uh, appreciate the the work of the team. Thank thank you for that. I appreciate that. I have um, in these virtual settings gotten comfortable with just some moments of silence as people you know gather themselves, find their um, the right buttons that they <laughs> they want to hit. So, um, but but I do appreciate uh, knowing that that folks can hear me. <laughs> And I know that everybody is engaged in this topic. So, uh, Member Forsberg, you had your hand raised, and then I'll go to Member I.D. Tollison. Yes, a question for Denise. Uh, earlier, you mentioned that there were 17 RGUs that were registered as participants and 22 consultants. Uh, and I guess, uh, is, is that list available? As you know, I'm concerned about the rural area having input into the pilot. And is the application period for being a pilot project open now, uh, will it close at some point? Madam Chair, um, board member Forsberg, no, the, the registration is open and what the registration um, allows is just to give us your contact information so that we can make sure that you know about all of the opportunities for support and learning as you go through the process. You don't have to be a registered participant to use the form or to, to try out the form and, and publish an EAW during this time. Um, our, we have an active recruitment um, process going on right now. And that's that we're actually going through and um, identifying over 300 um, RGUs statewide that have submitted um, EAWs over the last few years and making one-on-one -on -one phone calls to them to make sure they're aware of the opportunity. And um, to be honest, we, we have heard from some outstate RGUs that they do not and would not participate in the process um, for, for any reason. But I think our goal is to make sure that they know about the opportunity, they understand what's being asked, and they understand that it's an important opportunity for them to try out the form and provide their input, which will result in the questions and the framework that ultimately is included in the final EAW. And so we share your commitment to making sure that every voice is represented, represented in the data that we collect. So I guess what I'm asking Denise is uh, what the status of this recruitment program is, uh, who's applied and when it will end, when the period will end. The, the recruitment um, has been going on since, I believe, November, and um, I think it will likely go on through August since any project that would begin after that date would not likely be ready for notice. Um, but again, we're, we're not going to turn away anyone. I think if you want to end date, it would be the end of September when we have completed um, our data collection. All right, thank you. Member I.D. Tolleson. I see her hand raised, but I don't see her coming off mute. I was waiting for you. Oh, <laughs> Madam Chair. Okay, <laughs> thanks. All right, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> okay. Um, so I I also want to um, uh, commend the work of the of the subgroup and um, am really pleased with the decision to create a, a board member um, group that 
works with the project. And I think Nick's doing an excellent job. I also appreciate the clarification of roles in Table 1 in the pilot program participants. I think that's uh, really, really critical um, to understand and um, and accommodate all those roles. I had two questions that actually are related to uh, public comments that were made. Um, uh, uh, Mila Voss spoke about uh, mitigations. I really could not agree more about the importance of the question of mitigations and whether or not there is usable information uh, for mitigation development. And the, I'm coming at that from being a small, um, I'm a planning commissioner for many, many years in a small township, and um, and I've watched the process both in my jurisdiction and also particularly the county jurisdiction. And uh, I know that and the people are extremely concerned about the resources that they and their communities and the impacts on resources and communities. And I agree that um, trying to create some kind of uh, refocus on mitigation options is a way to deal with the oppositional nature of many of these projects. And I also I further think that. Um, or hope that the uh, question of mitigation and whether or not there's usable information could be added to the um, the metrics that you have, uh, because I think that's extremely relevant to RGUs in that one of the major ways in which RGUs use are, are challenged by their communities um, and use the uh, information in an EAW is to create conditions that will make uh, a project acceptable or manageable or have less impact on the community. And so I do think this is a really central um, question and not um, at least as information is important. You know, I, from my perspective is the GHG emissions questions, which are pretty abstract for most of the public. So that's my advocacy position on that particular item. And um, uh, my second one's, uh, refers to Jeff's comments. Now, if I took correctly that Jeff is a consultant, and it seemed that one of his questions was, um, where am I going to get guidance about this? And um, after our citizen briefing, Den or in our citizen briefing, uh, Denise reminded me about that many of my questions were addressed in the, or concerns were addressed in the guidance documents. So my question to the, um, the group and the pilot project is, how are you going to use that excellent guidance tool in your training and discussion with the RGUs and consultants? Um, I would love to see in the EAW form a little note at the bottom of each of the relevant climate, climate sections. See guidance page 22. See guidance page 44. Perhaps everyone who looks at an EAW form and contemplates filling it out knows how to use the guidance, but I'm not sure that's true. I'm, I, you know, especially among um, small RGUs and, and project proposers who are just regular people and who go ahead and, and do their own, try to do their own work. So um, I'd appreciate any feedback you have on that um, or, um, or just your ear. And uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Denise or Nick, do you want to provide any response on, on either of those two topics that member ID Tolson raised? So, Madam Chair, I, I can talk about the, the questions related to the guidance. And um, I think it's um, board member Martin brought it up and, and we've discussed earlier too that, that one of the primary um, reasons that we're doing the pilot program is to learn to learn where there might be gaps. And I would anticipate that during the cohort meetings, um, you know, RGUs and consultants will, will be able to raise that question. They'll, they'll be able to identify, you know, maybe where there are challenges in responding to a question on the form and then discuss how, how they might work together to come up with some recommendations and support each other as they go through the process. And then that information will be publicly available for anyone to consider how, how that question was answered and um, the result. And from that information, 
we will be able to better understand where there may be needs for more sector specific guidance or just technical support or even um, understanding which tools might have resulted in the better outcome. So we would further refine the guidance that's out there based on those types of discussions and deliberations. And so um, I think we'll have a, a good opportunity to, to help folks through the process when they attend those cohort meetings. Madam Chair, I, I, I would probably just use too many words. My basic question was, are you going to use the guidance that you've created in the discussions and in the training um, for the consultants and um, RGUs? That was uh, my question, we, sorry. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Kristen. I, I um, gave you a, a long answer to that short question. And, and the answer is yes, that we're going to encourage anyone who's participating, anyone that's using the form to try out the guidance as well. And that, that is a tool that would be up for consideration for revision as well as the questions on the AW form. Excellent, thank you. Did that fully address both of your comments, member ID Tolson? Were there, is, are there any other questions remaining? And I, I'm glad that you clarified your question. Yeah, sorry, I used too many words, yeah. So let me see if I can simplify my first one. Um, uh, is it, how is the, how are the metrics going to uh, include the effectiveness of information about mitigations um, for the consideration of the public and the RGUs. Is that any clearer? Um, Madam Chair, I, I think so. And I um, again, it's it's the RGU that makes a determination. So it's it's a project proposer who who um, you know essentially designs their project. They make the decision on whether or not they're going to propose mitigation. And the RGU takes that information and assesses the project as it's designed. And so there isn't a mechanism within the current environmental review procedures or even within the form that requires an action on, on that, on developing mitigation. But when it is included, there is um, space on the EAW form for a description of what that mitigation might be and how it um, will be implemented and the, and the effect of the mitigation. What we could do, and again, it's, um, you know, we could do our best to capture when mitigation has been proposed, but we would wanna stay on the right side of the line and not second guess an RGU or a project proposer in the type of mitigation they proposed, whether it was the right mitigation or get into sort of second guessing that RGU discretion. I see, I understand that. And um, I, I hope that uh, the process will continue to refer to the first chart at the beginning of the, of the EAW form that emphasizes the importance of adaptation and resilience. I think that's very relevant to the mitigation question. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, it looks like member Forsberg has his hand up again. I just also um, want to ask again if there are any other members of the subcommittee who haven't had a chance to speak yet, if um, there are folks who want to weigh in and um, we'll probably uh, look at trying to bring this conversation to some kind of summary here before too long. But um, member Forsberg, why don't you go ahead and we'll see if anybody else wants to chime in. Yeah, I'm just thinking of a, a practical implication here where <clears throat> typically a project proposer or an RGU perhaps would want to hire a consultant to do this work. Uh, so they'll need a scope of work. Um, the consultant will have to put together a cost estimate for doing that work or commit to a cost for doing that work. The guidance needs to be pretty specific so that the consultant knows what's going to be expected to put together a cost for it. I think this relates to one of the earlier comments from the public to say it depends upon what the RGE wants and uh, can be very variable. At some point, you end up with dollars and cents and how much work it's going to be. 
How do we deal with that? Member Forsberg, I might suggest that I think, you know, I, I think that in some ways it's it's good to put that question on the table. I'm not sure that's one we can answer right now. I think that's, you know, part of the um, learning process of the pilot and part of what Eris and the board will have to wrestle with after the fact, right? And and again, it's, is the information usable? Is it useful to um, proposers, to RGUs, and to members of the public in their various roles. And, you know, is is the value of that utility, right? Sort of balance with cost. I mean, there's always there's always a dollars and cents component and there's always a value to information. And I think, you know, absent sort of seeing the the totality of that, um, right? You know, I, I think I think it's it's hard to to equate values with you know, dollars and cents on one column and, and there's no dollars and cents on the other column, it's it's values. And so I, I just, I think we'll have to wrestle with that as we get that qualitative data back, right? And have to, to have to consider that into our informed decisions. I'm, I'm just thinking of myself as a uh, county engineer, say, and I need to do an EAW for a project, say a bridge project, need to hire a consultant. How do I write up the scope of work and how does a consultant put together a bid on that work unless there's specific guidance on what's needed? Well, and I think I think as as we've discussed here, the, you know, there is guidance. There isn't a specific formula because every project is is different. We can't get that prescriptive, right? I think as as both Chair Martin and, and Denise said, but you know, it's it's not as if we're without guidance. And then part of it is as we learn, right, if we don't feel we're getting what we need, right, that's part of what we learn. If we're getting too much, that's going to be something something we learn. So um, I, I think, I, you know, I, I think that is where we are, but I think we've done the best we can at this point to provide the balance of providing sufficient guidance, but not being overly prescriptive that, you know, we've created something that's one size fits all and, and doesn't doesn't work. And I don't know that that's wholly you know, I would say it's wholly different on these questions than other questions on the on the AW form. I guess just a, a thought on that, um, Alan. Um, I think it's a great question, a great practical question that will have to be sort of explored through the pilot. But if I were, so if I were a project proposer, I would show my consultant, okay, here's the new questions that now have to be answered. Just what's new on the form. And I want your help doing this. Um, I don't know exactly what answer is going to be adequate because there's going to be back and forth with my RGU on how much information they need. So give me a bid for what you think it's going to require to, to you know, look, answer those questions, look at the guidance and tools that are available, apply those tools to come up with what you think are adequate answers to those questions. And then if I were the consultant, I would say, okay, here's my bid, but here's my additional hourly rate because I don't know how many times I'm gonna you're gonna have to come back to me because the RGU wanted more. <laughs> so something like that, you know. Yeah, or perhaps if the uh, consultant asks you about the scope of work, you say, I don't know, go talk to the RGU. <laughs> Director Pratt. <laughs> yeah, and, and just to add to this, you know, board member Forsberg, I think Hopefully it's been clear all along through this process since the very beginning that the, the board had wanted and the staff team working on this and we brought interagency staff into the process that had been clear that we have to be able to in, implement this in, in some practical ways. And, and that's a shared goal that we have with you. And, you know, making sure those questions are clear, there has to be enough information there that um, an RGU and a consultant can understand the scope of work. We don't know what we don't know at this point. And so th there is gonna be some learning. We don't have all your answers, but we do share that goal. It, it, you know, and, and we will be looking for places to refine that. You know, as a reminder as well, um, as part of the pilot process, we have consultants that are joining the process. And right now I think we have 22 different consultants registered to, to participate and help give us feedback from that consultant angle as well. And that might also inform 
inform the process. So just adding that to, to the discussion. Yes, thank you, Katie. Yeah, it's sort of a reminder of why we're doing the pilot, right? And why we didn't just jump to, to questions on a form. So um, I'm not seeing other hands up, but I do want to make one last call for discussion, comments, questions from the subcommittee before we uh, uh, wrap this conversation. Okay, I've sat in my comfortable silence for a moment and I'm not still not seeing any. So um, I, I really, again, want to thank um, the, the SPPI for um, and all the members of that team for the work and uh, Chair Martin for your leadership of that group and, and Denise, obviously, for, for your work and presentation here today. I think actually the you know, we've had some good discussion and questions, but I think the fact that we haven't had more is is really testament to the work that you did. And I think to um, member ID Tolleson's point, you know, the the fact that we made the right call by setting up a, a group that could dig into that. So um, I want to I want to take a moment and just appreciate that work. Um, at least what I've heard today, I think, you know, some good questions and some good reminders that. Um, this is a learning process. This is going to be adaptive. You know, that that's the reason we chose the pilot route. I haven't heard and I will just um, check this. Someone can um, disagree if they feel differently. Haven't heard any specific suggestions for change um, or any red flags that have come out of this discussion. I think we heard some really good comments about um, again, uh, making sure that we can consider the, the practical applications and making sure that we are asking the right questions in the survey to get the right kind of information from um, uh, proposers and, and consultants and our GUs and, and, of course, the public as well. Um, and so, as, as I heard the responses, some of the issues that were raised about mitigation and, and other aspects of that, um, we can address that as we um, move through the pilot and continue to refine survey questions and continue to identify gaps. And so um, I think based on what I've heard, that would be my suggestion of how we um, proceed forward. But again, I will um, just check that uh, suggestion and, and my summary of the discussion here if uh, either staff or um, fellow members of the subcommittee want to weigh in. Uh, Madam Chair, um, I I think those were my takeaways too. That that most of the work that we'll take away from today are sort of adaptive changes to um, to maybe the survey questions, but that we need to be mindful and watching some of these key issues as we deliberate um, through the pilot program process. Member ID Tollefson. Yes, Madam Chair, thank you for that opportunity. That's very thoughtful of you to summarize and ask if there's anything more specific. I may just really be off base, but I was asking for a metric to be added about the information, um, the adequacy, the effectiveness of information on mitigation options. I was asking that to be added to the metrics. And I'm not, I won't take it any further than that, but I did want to clarify that I was asking for that. Thank you. Thank you for that clarification, Member ID Tolleson. And I, I think what I heard Denise say in her response was that's not precluded because the the question that's in the the framework and the memo that came forward is is the you know is the information usable and that the the mitigation piece clearly can be part of usable information and so um, that that can be accommodated as part of the adaptive piece. So, Madam Chair and um, um, Board Member Heidi Tollison, um, I, I agreed that I think we could get at information in the survey to respond to that type of question. The challenge with developing it as a metric would be that if we, we did that, we would say whether or not the questions were effective, if only if they they resulted in the, in that action that mitigation and that would be a little bit of overstep between the role of the EQB 
versus the role of the RGU in determining that effectiveness. And so what I, I could do is work with you offline and see if we could come up with some language um, that might further refine some of the metrics to sort of get at, at your um, desired um, boundary for, for how that information is used. Again, that's the purpose of the metric is to have a clear shared understanding of, of how the information that we capture will be used by board members when deciding on the EAW form. But I, I would um, be happy to give you a call and see if there's, there's something that we could come to to make sure that your needs are met too. I would appreciate that, Denise, and particularly because, as I understand environmental review um, uh, and even EAW, mitigation is an important factor. So I, I really would appreciate that. Thanks very much for the offer. Great. So, Member ID Tolson, does that, um, between uh, that work that you can do with Denise and the um, changes we can make on the survey, does that address uh, your specific request? I just want to make yes, sure. Yes, thank you very much, Chair Stroman. Good, thank you. Any final thoughts, questions? Chair, Chair Stroman, this is Executive Director Pratt, and I'll just chime in. Um, you know, one one of the things that I think is is hard to express, but I, I just wanted to share with with board members here is the the uh, the seriousness which with the staff team really takes the feedback both from the board and from members of the public and we really take it back and wrestle with it we don't always in the space of the meeting have the right answer or have the perfect solution but we take these notes and you know in our in our team discussions we, we wrestle with this information and we get to better results and i just think back to where we were you know six months or a year ago and you know the real transformation that's taken place and the refinement of our thinking and we've gotten clearer at every step of the way about about where we're going and how to describe this and what's needed and that's in part by the you know really good feedback and tough challenging questions that we get so um, we can't always you know map every step of our journey and every you know thought process that we go through but I can assure you that we really do take this feedback to heart and use it and work with it so we, we appreciate that. Yeah, Director Pratt, thank you for that. Because I think um, you know this this item is is on our agenda as a discussion item. We aren't taking votes and you know motions on specific additions and things, but I think it is is important um, to know that that the discussion matters, right? And that the the input matters and what we're trying to do again because this is not a a final product. It's an adaptive pilot process to to continue to get that feedback and continue to to make the the product better. So. Appreciate that. Um, Member Forsberg. Yes, uh, Katie referred to a journey we're on, and there are some waypoints along that journey that as a subcommittee member, uh, I would like to be informed about. One is the pilot projects, the RGUs that are going to participate up to say a certain date. So we can look at the distribution around the state. And then as the survey questions are developed, what are the survey questions? And then the evaluation as the results come back in, uh, uh, how is the summary of that evaluation going to take place? So, I, and I don't know how Nick feels about it, but I'd like to see the subcommittee uh, get information from staff at some waypoints along the way here. And Does member, that make any Forsberg, sense? member Forsberg, I, I do believe that. Um, both uh, Denise and uh, Chair Martin mentioned, you know, the ongoing work of the the subcommittee, and so I think that that request is appropriate to to take to the subcommittee and have you know the subcommittee um, work with staff as to the appropriate check-ins and milestones, and then obviously, you know, uh, I know Eris will continue to have uh, interest as will the the entire board, but I think that's a those are um, very appropriate. <laughs> Uh, issues to take up with the with the um, implement the pilot implementation subcommittee. I I would also note it must be a lot warmer in St. Paul because I see behind you, Sarah, a lake with ducks, and green trees, and gee, that looks nice. It's not like that at all in Mankato here. 
Well, I will assure you, it doesn't actually look like this outside my window, but um, it's it's a little bitter, a little more bitter today than it has been. So I thought uh, I needed to to have some uh, open water and sunny weather in my background. And those are loons actually in the background, but they're so small, you can't see them. Not done. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for the explanation. As I was ready to move to St. Paul. All right. Well, I um, thank you for uh, your additional comments there, and, and thank you to uh, all of the subcommittee members and um, all of the members of the public who joined us today and, and shared your thoughts and participation. I think, again, this has been a really thoughtful discussion. These discussions are really important to making sure that um, the pilot is as useful as it can be and that we really get the information out of it in order for the board to, to make a good decision at the end. So. Thank you. Um, that does conclude our work for the day and we're at the end of the agenda. So um, I would at this time uh, consider a motion to adjourn. Would someone like to make that motion? I'll make a motion, Al Forsberg. Thank you, is there a second? I can second that. Thank you, Commissioner Kessler. All those in favor of the motion to adjourn, if you could unmute yourself and please signify by saying aye. 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 Any, any opposed to the motion to adjourn? Uh, hearing none, the motion carries and the meeting is adjourned. Thank you all very much for your time today. And uh, Katie and Denise and the rest of the team there at the EQB, thank you for all of the great support for the ARIS subcommittee meeting here today.